It's quarter two. Just quickly, with chasing reds and nanny guy, firstly, when I first moved up here, I was told that you only will catch them at night. I moved up here 15 years ago. I've been up here 16 now. I remember being told, Scotty, you only catch these fish at night. And I said, oh, that's cool. So I you know, put all my energy into chasing nanny guys and reds at night. I used to go out and do quite well. First few years, I caught nothing. And then slowly, I started to learn a bit more. Hung out with a couple of good pros in Lucinda. Slowly learned a bit more. But then, I, you know, a couple of times I went out during the day and I worked out that you don't have to catch them only at night. I mean, you'd, uh, you'd probably agree with me there. It's all about where you're fishing to catch these redfish, okay? So daytime, look, I totally agree that nighttime they do bite a little bit better. There's no doubt about it. They'll school up a bit better. They'll generally be a bit more aggressive. But to target these good fish, you don't have to fish at night. It's all really where or where the country you're going to be chasing. And I'm going to just quickly brush on that. Back when I started fishing with the old men, fishing to me was you'd get out to the reef, for example, bramble, lodestone, you'd get to the rough, the shallows of the reef, the sand would start going like this, you're on the reef. And that, that was reef fishing, as far as I, I knew and the way the old man taught me. But what I've learned now since coming up here and fishing with these guys, and this, this theory applies to up and down the whole East Coast. I know fellas that win the Red Emperor tournaments at the Rainbow Beach comp down south, they win the biggest snapper, they win all of these bigger fish, and they're all fishing on this same sort of country. And you've probably all heard me write about, you see, you know, fellas write and talk about the shoals or these isolated rocks or these wonky holes. Has everyone heard of them? You hear guys like me talk about them all the time. And that, I mean, they are as true as I'm standing here. That's exactly where these big fish are hiding. And they can be up to 15, 18 mile away from any major reef. They can be in the middle of nowhere. Like I remember, I remember fishing back off Lucinda there. I've got spots in between a few white girls between the end of the jetty and the islands there. As shallow as 18 metres and you can be catching eight and 10 kilo fish. Uh, and the key to finding them is being able to read your sounder, okay? Uh, I encourage people, and I tell that many people, that being able to read your sounder at speed is so important. I might get video, hello. Yeah, mate. Uh, but yeah, being able to read your sounder at speed is so important. And if you have any drama with it, go back to your manufacturer or the, the people you buy the boat from. You may have to readjust your, your transducer. It might be sitting in a bad V of the boat, gets a little bit of bubble under it. But being able to read your sounder at speed is very, very important. Okay, so that's tip number one. And when you're travelling out, you know, a lot of guys, even to this day, I remember taking uh, the mayor of Ingham, the, the great Pino, the ex-mayor and his brothers, lived in Ingham all their life. And we took them out, I took them out to a little patch, we stopped in the middle of nowhere, and they would just be, well, what are we doing here? We're not at the reef yet. You know, baits down, we, we ended up catching a couple of nice big nannies and a couple of big reds because, you know, they hadn't fished this way. They'd always been out to the reef and fished the way that they'd done it for many, many years. So being able to read your sandwich at speed is, is crucial. And, you, and the thing is, as well, you won't get much of a a jump up sometimes in the sounder. So you would be watching your sounder, you might only get, like when you're doing 20 or 30 knots, it might only be like a vertical bar, you might get a tiny blimp or something a little bit different on the bottom. And that's when you do your big Yui, you come back and try, I mean, you know, you've got all those different theories about how you get on your GPS and, you know, and work out how to get back into your own track. Trust me, you'll get lost, you'll do circles. The best thing is to do a lap. If you look directly behind you straight away, you'll see your bubble trail and just get back into that. I used to watch my GPS, and by the time you do a turn, then you overcorrect, you, normally, you generally lose your thing. So if you go over a good mark, zip straight around, look, you can see where you've been, get straight back in your trail, and then go over it nice and slow at about six knots, and you'll find that going over a lot slower as opposed to speed, uh, you'll see a completely different picture. So generally, as I said, they're flat. They're only the size of maybe a small boat. Some of them could be a couple of boats, but they they won't be big areas. But what they'll do is the bottom will actually dense or thicken up. The wonky holes will actually make like a V in the sand. But but generally, a lot of the spots that I fish, the density will actually thicken. So you're not really looking for too much that jumps up on the sander. It's more so the bottom thickening up. So is that making sense to all you fishers? Yeah. So it just it just gets a bit thicker like that. So. I've got Garmin in my boat now. I used to have Furuno, a lot of the, the colour codes, and it's normally a, a dense orange or amber colour, and it'll just thicken up. So you've got your general line, then all of a sudden you'll get over this spot, and it'll go like that, thicken up, and you think, ah, it might only go for, as I said, the size of a small car, and that's all. It'll just thicken up, and hopefully you'll see a couple of speckles of bait, and you might even see a couple of nice big standings sitting on top of them. So if you see those couple of big standings, here she comes. She wants to come and get a boat, Mum. Hello. Now, who is that big ugly man up there? So, so keeping an eye on the sounder and watching it to, to thicken up, that's, that is the key with chasing Emperor Nanny Guide. As I said, I'm living in Townsville now, I've been here for a couple of years, but out of Lucinda for 15 years, 
um, and there's good country all through here. I mean, I've been out off the Cape now in between, in the middle of nowhere, at Lucinda between Hinchinbrook Island and Bramble and Brudermart Reefs. I reckon I'd have 50 rocks. Uh, I probably don't fish them as much now. Back 10 years ago, yeah, I, I would use the guarantee word. I don't often use guarantee, someone's being naughty. But uh, you could go to those little rocks inshore there, 30 metres, and always get a couple of nice reds, a couple of nice nanny guy. You still can today, but obviously people like me are here educating and, and like to share our secrets. So a lot more people are fishing these sort of areas. But, but that's the key, being able to read your sander well away from any reef. And if you've got one good spot, don't be afraid to throw some lures out, go for a bit of a troll around, because these rocks, are, they're scattered everywhere. And there's nothing better than going for a bit of a, a look and you find a new rock and you catch a couple of big nannies uh, you'll also get those big gold spot cod. Generally, if you're on a spot pretty early, the big gold spot cod will come up, come up first. You'll get jobfish on them. You'll get a few little, you know, a few smaller little like golden band snappers and those sort of things. But the big natties and the big reds will hang on these rocks. Generally, not in big numbers, but uh, if you can find yourself a little isolated patch of rock, uh, you're halfway there. So, does that make sense? Any questions about that? Any? Trying to educate all you anglers. A couple of people are going, Scotty, just not too much about. It. Keep it down, Scotty. But that's, that is the key, being able to read your sander at speed and being confident to go for a bit of a look and have a look around. Like some of the spots, as I said, they're nowhere near the main reef, nowhere at all, in the middle of nowhere, uh, and that's where these big fish hang. Right towards the end there, yes, darling? Yeah, no, but if you all three match up and say five to ten, smile, because it means it's good, good time spread on the waters. But plenty of good fishing to be had out here. And also, too, ask your local tackle shops, all the guys, the fishing warehouse, tackle world, uh, Aqua Marine, all those guys are very knowledgeable. They've got good guys in their stores. So if you need to know anything local, pop in and, and ask those sort of guys. But uh, all right, that's it from me. I'm going to have a drink of water. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks for thanks for listening. That was a bit of fun. And um, say goodbye on the camera there. Oh, did I get a clap? Thank you. And the best boat licenses in Australia over there. The discount today, 20% off. Go over and see the beef. You haven't got your boat license. All right, thanks for that. Uh, we'll be having the uh, the Tackle World Real Challenge shortly for the kids out on the grassed area in front of the guy fishing. Uh, geez, Scotty, the day's nearly gone. Sound is the key number one. Now for bait, if I could every day of the week, the best bait I find during the day, if I can get it, is live bait. Whether it be live yakkers or small little live flame tails or little, anything small, if I can get live bait, without a doubt, live bait's the best. But here we're not spoiled with those yakka grams like they are down south, so live bait can be sometimes a bit of a drama. In winter you tend to get them on your rocks, but this day and age, in summer, the liveys can be very tough. Uh, next best thing is fresh bait. I buy all my bait from where I buy my seafood I'm going to eat. So Cleveland Road, Ingham Road Seafood, all those places where you're going to eat the seafood, that's what I buy for bait. So fresh bait is the key. Darcy? There you go, the young fella. Where the trawlers come in, you can buy fresh bait straight off the trawler. So, perfect, perfect. So, just reiterating, during the day is fine. Your sounder is key using fresh bait. If you can't get live is using fresh bait is very, very important. What rig do I use for the nannies? When I first moved up here 17 years ago, I used to fish with the running ball sinkers and burly. I used to get very technical because I thought I knew. I quickly worked out the key is finding where these fish are. I just fish now with a standard pattern oster rig, which is a dropper rig, sinker on the bottom with one hook up a bit higher, and I generally just fish with one hook, about a 9-0, uh, Gamagatsu hook, and just with one hook. Um, if you find these fish, the biggest thing with them is you may find these areas and they may not want to chew. I've had times where I've had them marked up on the sander, it might be a run-in tight, they don't want to bite. So what I might do is I might have eight rocks in the area, I'll go for a bit of a lap, might get one off that rock, nothing, nothing. The tide turns, and I know that that spot had fish on it, I'll come back on the run out tide, and maybe because the current's hitting the rock a bit of a different way, or hitting those shoals a bit different, the fish will be sitting a bit different into the current, they may, they may feed. So, but once again, I've had times where you come back onto the rocks, on the run out tide, you still can't get them to bite. So that can be the biggest pain in the bum sometimes, getting them to bite during the day. But, uh, but generally, um, that, that's what I like to do. Do I anchor or drift? I normally drift through these areas. I've never really been a big one for anchoring. Uh, probably because I had a big boat, it was, it was too much effort. But now I've got the smaller hooker, I do a bit more anchoring. But, but generally drifting is all I do. And yeah, they're not big numbers normally on these rocks. They'll be good quality, but they won't be big numbers. So, yeah. So drop a rig, fresh bait. If I had to pick a moon, uh, generally leading into either moon is good. Uh, I prefer the dark moon. I don't, it's just what works for me. I do catch them leading into the full moon, but I've just found that the dark moon, I've had more success. I tend to find that they chew a bit better. Uh, leading into the dark moon. Time of year, 
you know, people talk about winter's the best time, the red's coming in closer, but I, you know, I tend to find coming out of winter, I seem to have caught my biggest and best numbers and quality. So I'm talking September, October, which is good for the coral trout, it's good for everything. And you generally find that a lot of the nannies and that are rode up that time of year. So when they're rode up, they're spawning, in, uh, their, their aggression increases because they're spawning. So generally September, October, if I had to pick the best month. But you get them all year round without a doubt. So, uh, so where were we? So we talked about bait, the dropper rig, day or night. Any other questions? No? Okay. Wealth of information. I'm on the video camera there. Hello again. Any more questions out there? No.